This is a podcast for Zion Lutheran Church's adult and high school Sunday school class. The following is from Rev. Dr. Matthew Richard. everyone doing? You guys hear me okay? All right. Well, this is our final installment here and uh, of what we've been going through, the uh, same-sex marriage, um, understanding of the philosophy, theology, and impact. And so we're going to do a little Q&A today, and I have about seven or eight questions that were sent to me. So we'll use those questions as a basis as we move forward. Uh, So we'll use these seven to eight questions as a basis to move forward. And then next week, what I'd like to do next week and the weeks to come is this. Um, This is kind of a little bit of an audible of the line of scrimmage, just kind of getting feedback. Uh, Next week, what I thought would be beneficial to do would be go through a little bit of history of the Western civilization, uh, talking about how we got here, historically speaking, not necessarily in regard to same-sex marriage, but in regard to culture, what's happening on culturally speaking in relationship to the church. Uh, There's no doubt about it that when we look at the church, Uh, the church is actually in a minority position. Um, At one point in time, it was in the majority position. In other words, it was very influential in culture, and now we are seeing the church enter into a time period where it has lost its influence, it's lost its, um, I guess you would say, pull. And so we'll talk about that next week, okay, the historical shifting and changing that's going to be happening. In the weeks to come, what I'd like to do is kind of start talking about you know, as far as relating and interacting with other individuals. Uh, Maybe teach you a little bit of apologetics, okay? So the word apologetic is not necessarily to apologize to the faith. It's to how to defend the faith, how to interact with individuals around you. In other words, when you have a conversation, whether it's on same-sex marriage or whether it's on the scriptures or whether it's a cultural issue or a doctrinal issue, how do you respond to them? Um, What are some of the different tactics uh, that you can... uh, implement um, what is actually going on. And so I'd like to pull the layers back there a little bit and give some real practical application. Uh, So that's just kind of my thought as we kind of lead up to the Christmas season here in the next couple weeks. Sound good? All right. So without further ado, let's jump into things. So same-sex marriage, questions and answers. I asked you for questions and I received seven to eight of them. And uh, so I typed out the seven to eight questions for you printed them here, and I'll do my best to try to give you some answers. These are not answers necessarily coming from my expertise by any means, but they're answers that uh, I've come across as far as feedback. And we'll be getting into some legality things, and I need to confess to you that I'm not a law expert, okay? And so you keep in mind that a pastor is trained theologically speaking. So um, my training is theological, also a little bit of philosophy in the midst of that, but when it comes to legality issues, I can only give you more of a layman's perspective when it comes to the law, uh, my understanding of it, and you might have some uh, understandings that might be better than I have here in regards to some of these questions here that we'll look at. So the first question says this, that uh, we received. uh, With the Supreme Court ruling, is it or will it be mandatory that all LCMS churches do same-sex marriage? What would you say? Is it going to be mandatory that all Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate churches do same-sex marriage. Can the government come in and say that we as a church must, by law, perform a same-sex marriage? No. Why would you say no? Separation of church and state. Yep. Now, believe it or not, you've, you've heard that phrase, separation of church and state, okay? Uh, it's a very popular phrase, and what I find very amazing is is historically speaking, the separation of church and state was not to keep the church out of the state. Historically speaking, it was to what? Keep the state out of the church. I would say the majority of the people that use that phrase, that that cry and use that phrase, are always saying, we've got to keep the church out of the state. We've got to keep the church out of the state. No, originally it was written for the perspective, um, uh, originally it came forth, that ideology came forth from the perspective to keep the state out of the church. Historically speaking, the state has always gotten involved with the church and has always wreaked havoc among the clergy and the laity of the church. My understanding of this is with the Supreme Court ruling, is it or will it be mandatory that all LCMS churches do same-sex marriage? Uh, My understanding is that the answer would be no. 
And the reason why it would be no would be because of the First Amendment. The First Amendment, which says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So Congress cannot establish a state church. Okay? If you go overseas to uh, Europe, they have state churches. Um, our Congress will not make a law to establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So under the First Amendment, uh, my understanding is underneath that amendment, we as a church cannot be forced, cannot be forced to do a same-sex marriage. Otherwise, it would be a violation of our First Amendment rights. Okay? So that should bring a sense of, uh, okay, uh, definitely the, the separation of the church and state, uh, that the, the state only can go so far, but when it comes to the free exercise of religion, uh, we as the church um, are definitely uh, have religious freedom in that respect. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yep. And you keep in mind, uh, as Jim said there, that there are other options. Uh, there are other options of being married. You can get married um, by the justice of the peace. You can be married by a pastor. You can be married in the church. I know in Montana that uh, the law states that anybody can do a marriage. You do not have to be an ordained clergy. So you could go get your uh, brother and say, hey, meet me down by the river. Let's get a couple witnesses. And, you know, my gal and I, we're going to get married here this afternoon down by the river. And uh, the bro- your brother could simply do the wedding as long as you have a marriage certificate. So I know that's with Montana. Each state uh, is, is uh, dependent upon its own state laws. But I know Montana, anyone can get married. And besides, another aspect, too, <laughs> And it's not ordainme.com, but it's uh, the Universal Life Church. You can obtain an ordination certificate under seven minutes, and you can print it off. And then for $149.99, you can get a pastor and a box kit, which uh, they send you basically. Uh, I'm serious on this. I, I had a youth down in California as I was going through the ordination process uh, with, with my previous denomination, which was a, quite a lengthy uh, ordeal to be ordained. And uh, as I was just finishing up the ordination process, all the paperwork and meetings and so forth, he comes to me and says, guess what, pastor? He goes, you're looking at another fellow rev right here, reverend. And I said, what, Kevin? He goes, yeah, I was ordained this afternoon. I went on to Universal Life Church and it took me seven minutes and I'm ordained. And he took out the sheet of paper and guess what? It was legit. It was recognized by the state of California as a legitimate uh, ordination. He had just turned 18, so he was legitimately uh, or, or ordained clergy, so everyone started calling him Rev. <laughs> now, uh, you know, did he do anything with it? No, it ended up in the trash. He just did it for fun, but uh, so the grand scheme of things, basically anyone can get married by anyone they want, uh, essentially, in our culture at this time. Okay, so First Amendment, uh, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And so to answer question number one, um, I do not believe uh, LCMS churches will be forced to do same-sex marriage. Question number two, if LCMS churches, clergy, refuse to do same-sex marriage, are they subject to or at the risk of any legal actions by the federal or state agency or marriage couples? Okay. So if clergy refuse to do same-sex marriage, are they subject to any risk of legal actions either by the federal or state agency or marriage couples? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I do know, I've heard over the years, uh, just in passing by with articles, that there have been instances where uh, clergy and churches have been attempted to be sued, uh, but to no avail on this. Uh, so uh, there's been a couple instances where I've, I've read articles where uh, a same-sex couple have actually tried to bring up le- legal issues towards the church, but uh, they have not been successful. I would say that on this, um, we as the church are not going to be subject to any legal actions by the federal or state agency or marriage couples. I would say no, but there is something that might possibly be uh, that I've seen pop up And like I said, I am not a legal expert on this, but um, this is something that I've been seeing pop up from time to time. I'm told from what I've been reading that this probably will not be likely, 
but it is this. It's the threat of losing the tax-exempt status of the church. So in other words, since same-sex marriage is the law of the land in our nation at this point in time, um, there is a possibility, and like I said, I don't know how much, but there would be a possibility that the church would lose its tax-exempt status. This is actually, there's an article written by Mark Oppenheimer in the New York Times. He's a New York Times columnist, and he says this. He says, rather than try to rescue tax-exempt status for organizations that dissent from settled public policy on matters of race or sexuality, we need to take a more radical step, he wrote. It is time to abolish or greatly diminish their tax-exempt statuses. In other words, if there's a ruling a while back, and I'm, I, forgive me, I do not know, know the exact name of the ruling, but uh, it was the interracial uh, marriage of African-American and Caucasians uh, getting married. Uh, there was a university, Bob Jones University, that would not recognize uh, a marriage between an African-American and a Caucasian. And that was basically what happened is they lost their tax-exempt status, if, if I remember the case correctly. So that's being appealed to, sim- simply saying that if the churches will not recognize a same-sex marriage, that the church may be in a position to lose its tax-exempt status. What would that mean if we lost our tax-exempt status? Yep, the church would be taxed. So, um, like I said, my understanding from what I've read on this, the little that I've read this, I think if anything were to be coming down the pike, uh, I think this would be the uh, next step that would happen, would be a loss of tax-exempt status. But uh, in my humble opinion, from the limited research that I've done on this, I don't think this is a reality. But if it were to be a reality, then everything that we take in, we would be taxed on. Okay? So our budget is approximately what? 170 you know, with all the giving? Probably, let's just say 150000 So we have a $150,000 budget here at our church times what? 15, 20%. Okay. We're looking at twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year in taxes. I would assume so that the donations would not be tax exempt either. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's the whole point. Um, and, that's, and I think that's where the, the contention comes that if we're not tax exempt, then that would be no longer separation of church and state. I think you're ex- exactly right there. Now, like I said, um, I, from what I've read on this, the articles, I've read about three or four articles on this, most articles say that this is not a reality. Highly doubtful. But if there is going to be any um, consequence, it's not going to be Pastor Matt Richard ends up going to jail over the weekend for not doing a, to doing a same-sex marriage. It would be all of us being penalized with tax-exempt status. I think that would be the more likely of the two options. Again, um, as I share with you, I, I am not a legal expert, so this is just my limited research on this. And so um, I think it's very important for people to speak. Hey, you know, when you speak authoritatively, you do on areas that you're, 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 you're trained in, but other things that you're not, you speak loosely. So theologically, I'll speak with, you know, with a gusto, you know, with, with a little bit of force. But on this, I'm going to just kind of lightly share this is my understanding. I could totally be proven uh, wrong on many of these things. Question number three. Who will protect any local congregation, clergy, against any legal actions brought by a denial of same-sex marriage? So who would protect the clergy? Who would protect the church if there is any legal actions? The law? This is the importance um, this is the importance of being a part of a synod. This is the importance of walking together. Uh, part of our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, we have a three uh, kind of three uh, prong approach: uh, witness, mercy, and life together. So we witness, we confess the gospel together with our other brothers and sisters in the LCMS. We also uh, do mercy work together. And by the way, if you don't realize this, uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is phenomenal, has a phenomenal track record of mercy work worldwide. Millions and millions and millions of dollars have been implemented by the LCMS worldwide worldwide through Lutheran mercy uh, work. Okay? We're very involved with mercy work. Okay? So we do witness, mercy, and then the third one is life together. And so we walk in this life together. And so this is the importance of not being a rogue pastor or rogue church. We walk together and we support each other. So we as a church are 
plugged into a local circuit, the southeast circuit, which basically it starts at Gwinner and goes all the way to Wapaton. So some of the churches in our circuit are going to be Gwinner, Lisbon, Lidgerwood, uh, Lidgerwood Rural, Barney, Hankinson, uh, Belford, Wapaton, Great Bend, um, Fairmont, and there's one in South Dakota, the, uh, Clare City. Yes, Clare City. So those are the churches that we walk together in our circuit. But then bigger than our circuit is going to be our district. We have some 80, 80 to 90 churches in our district, some 25,000 people we walk with in our district. And then bigger than that is going to be our synod, which is some 2.5 million members across the United States. And then bigger than that, we have brothers and sisters in Canada. Uh, we have brothers and sisters down in uh, Brazil, uh, over in Africa, all over the world that we walk together with in the same confession. So this is the importance of walking together. So who will protect us? Uh, we have uh, those that are around us. Now, we did something a while back, and I never thought we'd have to implement this. Um, thanks to Jim Ashey, he was the chairman at the time. He did a lot of legwork on this. We actually drafted a marriage policy for Zion Lutheran Church, and uh, that was something that I saw on the horizon, and I told uh, the elder board, I said, you know, we need to get to work on this because I think in the next 10 to 15 years this may be a reality. Little did I know it was going to be, what, a year and a half later that this would have been, this is needed. So we actually passed this, we actually passed this uh, relatively soon after I got here as pastor, and uh, it was important to pass it before everything happened. Uh, the reason being is it shows we're not reactionary, that this is actually what we believe, confess uh, to, believe, to be true. And so it's a Zion, uh, Zion Lutheran Church's marriage policy. Let me read it for you. I can get you copies of this later. It says, The marriage policy of Zion Lutheran Church, a member congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, is and always has been consistent with the Synod's belief on marriage. So right there, what are we doing? We're attaching our local church to who? Synod. Okay? So if there's a sense where we're ever picked on or we're ever confronted, you end up coming against our local church, you are actually what? Going to have to go talk to our synod. We walk together with them. Now, if we were an independent Lutheran church, we could not appeal to something greater than ourselves. And then the policy goes on to say this, we believe that marriage is a sacred union of one man and one woman, and we appeal to who? Genesis 2, 24 through 25. If you can recall a couple sessions ago, we said we define marriage not on the basis of popular opinion, but we define marriage on the basis of the word of God. So Genesis 2, 24 through 25. And that God gave marriage as a picture of a relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. So as we look at Christ and his church, the church is usually referred to as the feminine, as the she. Okay? And Christ is the masculine, the bride, the bride and the bridegroom. So we see right there between the bride and bridegroom uh, of Ephesians chapter 5. The official position of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is set forth in 1998 Resolution 321. What are we appealing to there? Our synod's definition of marriage is to affirm the sanctity of marriage and reject same-sex unions. So back in 1998, our synod has actually dealt with this back in 1998, and we're appealing not to our own opinions, we're appealing to Scripture, and we're appealing to our synod that we walk with together. Okay? Uh, is that homosexual unions come under the categorical prohibition in the Old and New Testament? And we have all those verses that we've covered before from a couple weeks ago. As contrary to the Creator's design, these positions and beliefs can be found on the LCMS website, along with other statements, papers, and reports on the subject of homosexuality and same-sex civil unions and marriage. Our pastor, uh, pastor or pastors, plural, okay? That means if you end up having, calling an associate pastor here, all of your pastors will not officiate over any marriages inconsistent with these beliefs. And our church property may not be used for any marriage ceremony, reception, or other activity that would be inconsistent with our belief and this policy. So what happened there with that policy that was passed by the voters assembly uh, several years ago? We are tying ourselves as a church to our synod on the basis of the word of God. 
and you're tying your pastor to who? The Word of God and the Synod. And you are tying this facility to what? The Word of God and the Synod. In other words, this does a couple things. Okay? It prohibits a rogue pastor from what? Violating the church's confession. So if you have, like let's just say for me as a pastor, I say, hey, I want to do a same-sex marriage. You would say according to our marriage policy, you're not only violating the facility of this building, but you're violating the synod as well. Okay? And violating scripture. So you're binding the pastor to this. You're binding the building to this and you're binding, um, binding the overall church. So if, if we are challenged, if I am challenged on this as a pastor, I simply have this marriage uh, policy. I simply say, I can't do this and we cannot use your, the facility because A, it's against God's word and B, it's against our synod's stance. So then if I am sued or if I get uh, uh, illegal actions, then I have what? You to fall back on, and you have what? The synod. Okay, so we're all walking together. That makes sense? In the same confession. So this is the reason why, in my humble opinion, this is the reason why it is so important to walk together with other Christians of the same confession. Because within our synod, uh, within our synod, we have all sorts of lawyers, we have all sorts of uh, uh, financial experts and resources and so forth um, that is there for us to walk together and support. Make sense? So this is uh, kudos to our elder board, uh, especially Jim, for all the hard work that they did on this. Um, like I said, I didn't think we would implement it or have to use it for at least 15 years, and, uh, and it's been a year and a half since it's been implemented. So very, very, very much kudos to you and the, and the elder board for the work on that. Okay, any questions or comments on that? Question number four. If LCMS churches um, refuse or deny same-sex marriages, um, same-sex marriages, are, are they at, at the loss of federal dollars loans for future development or improvement to universities, buildings, and churches? Okay, a little bit of a fragmented question. So my understanding of what this question is, is if we do not do same-sex marriage, um, are our universities, we have 10 universities, um, our buildings, are we subject to any penalties? Um, now, that's, that's the more tricky question. I, I'm going to have to plead a little bit of ignorance there. I know it's cut and dry for the church, but what do you do with the university? What do you do with a private private school, okay? Um, there's no doubt about it that this is a church, right? You look at this, this is a church. Uh, it's much more easy to understand separation of church and state, right? Um, but what happens when it comes to a university? Um, I don't know on that, the ramifications. We've, we've seen this at play, um, even in the business field with, with Hobby Lobby, not wanting to fu fund abortifacts, okay, uh, in healthcare plans. And so, uh, the argument has been, well, the Hobby Lobby is not a religious organization. It's a business. Uh, there is a group of sisters, uh, nuns, that uh, feed and help the poor. And I'm trying to rem remember the exact name of them. But they were uh, against the Obama administration saying that uh, as a bunch of nuns, they did not want to pay for uh, birth control, you know, as mandated by the Obamacare. And so I believe their case, boy, if my memory serves me right, I think there was some, some difficulties, and I think they might have lost a portion of it. Um, so that makes it a little bit more tricky when you're not dealing with uh, specific churches, but when you're dealing with universities and humanitarian-type uh, um, agencies uh, that will not follow that. So I, I'm going to have to plead ignorance on that question. I don't know exactly for sure. Question number five, what position has Zion, clergy, church, and clergy taken to protect themselves, himself, against any legal action if necessary? And will or have they taken any action already to protect themselves? Okay. Um, now, obviously, we have Zion's marriage policy, which has already been enacted, um, voted on, and established, which is really good. Um, but there's another aspect to this. I want to share with you how I'm going to personally handle this as a pastor. 
Um, I know in the Church of the Lutheran Brethren that I was a part of for 10 years, uh, it was very, very lenient as far as doing weddings. Um, and so um, if a person came to you and said, hey, I'm not a part of your church, would you be willing to do my, my wedding? And um, I did a couple weddings for family members who were not a part of the Lutheran Brethren and uh, so forth. And, um, and so my understanding from what I've been talking with the, the uh, other pastors in our district uh, that and, and some pastors have done this already, and I know a lot of churches um, across the United States, this is a policy that they have in mind already. Um, but where I'm coming down on this is this, is while I, while I you know, if I'm approached about doing a same-sex marriage, uh, my first response is not going to be yes or no. The first question is going to be, are you an LCMS member? Okay? In other words, in other words, uh, for me as a pastor, moving towards uh, doing weddings for only LCMS members. Okay, so if we have a, a son of the congregation, let's say let's just say a son of the congregation, uh, or a daughter of the congregation uh, that goes off to college and they meet, uh, let's just say a, a, a you know, let's just pick on Reed, right? So Reed goes off. Sorry, Reed. Uh, he goes off to college and he meets meets a beautiful Catholic gal and he comes back and says, we want to get married. What do we do the wedding? I would say, yes, I'll do the wedding because you are a member. And then w- as we go into membership classes, uh, you know, w- uh, marriage counseling, we would have to talk to your fiance about, hey, you know, are you going to become a member and try to move her towards membership? Uh, but if she says, no, we're, we're not going to attend church here whatsoever. We're not going to be Lutheran. Reed's going to become Catholic. And all that, then I would say simply, well, you know, maybe you should consider going to the Catholic Church and being married there. You see how that works? So the, the thing is, then, is this, is the reason why we will use membership is this, is, is that we will do member, uh, weddings, for member, weddings for members only. Um, so if a couple comes up, Pastor, will you marry us? And I would say, are you an LCMS member? They would say no. And then I would say, Zion only performs marriages for LCMS members. You will have to go through our membership class to become a member first. Are you open to membership classes and meetings? Okay. And the point of that is this, is in our membership class, we go through the catechism. And to be a member of this church, you have to say, I adhere to the small catechism. That is the criteria for membership. So you've seen with people coming forward, uh, standing up at the altar, right? What do they confess? We agree with the small catechism. Okay. So like when Virginia, can I pick on you, Virginia? When, when Virginia, um, she was engaged to Rich, and so we sat down, and Virginia worked through the small catechism, and since she was in Fargo, we were back and forth on emails, and she read the whole catechism book, wrestled with it, and we had a couple areas where we're like, well, ah, she's like, I don't know if I agree with this or not, and we kind of, you know, and I duked it out, and I, I pounded her down in submission, right? Uh, no, we worked it out, and we processed it, and she finally got to the point saying, yes, I agree with that, Okay. And so then what happens? She comes and she confesses that she agrees, right, with the, the, uh, the statement of faith of the church. So now my point is this. My point is this. In our explanation of small catechism, um, question number one, boy, 181 and 182 are the, the scripture passages. I, I believe it's question 57. It talks about how God forbids sexual sin, such as rape, homosexuality, activity, uh, so homosexual activity, incest, sexual child abuse, um, and the use of pornographic materials and so forth. And so the question then is if, 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 a, if a same-sex couple is coming and wanting to be married here, they would have to become members first. And then the question is, uh, in, to be a member of this church, would they adhere to our small catechism? Yes or no? Could they? In good conscience, they could not. In fact, if they said, well, we're going to become members, and they would actually stand up and say, yes, we adhere to our small catechism and the statement of faith of this church, by doing that, they're publicly condemning themselves. See how that works? And so the membership becomes kind of the gate, okay, um, towards the uh, issue of whether or not to do marriage. Does that make sense? So membership... Membership in the church um, <coughs> hinges upon the small catechism. And so in other words, uh, my, my response would be is if I'm asked to do a wedding, um, I would say, well, are you a member? Now keep in mind, if you go to Fargo, 
and let's just say, uh, pretend like you're, you're engaged, you go to Fargo, uh, generally speaking, no matter which church you go to, if, if we were to go down to an ELCA church, let's just say, and you walk in the ELCA church and say, hey, I'd like to get married here, you know what they're going to say? Are you an ELCA member? And you would say no, and they would say, no, we don't do that. In bigger cities, this is implemented, not necessarily, not necessarily for the same reasons. In bigger cities, this is implemented because there's so many people that want to get married and they just want to walk into the church and pick a nice church with a steeple and get married there that if they were to allow that to happen, some of these really pretty churches in the cities, they would have weddings, what? Four or five weddings every weekend. So in order to protect the church from being just basically used, right, by the average person on the street, most churches of all denominations, liberal and conservative, generally speaking, they have that policy of only members, marriages for, for members only. That makes sense? So um, what would that look like? Uh, I'll give me an example. Um, like, I'll give you an example. Andrew and Katie are getting married next December. Okay. Uh, so they asked, would you do the wedding? Andrew's the son of the congregation. Absolutely. Katie's coming from a Methodist background. Uh, she's going through catechesis classes and becoming LC. I believe she already has been in, in Bismarck. Okay. So if she hasn't, then I would actually sit down in, in premarital class and just simply talk about how the blessing would be on the same page, you know, as a, as a family. And I can actually attest from my own upbringing, where my dad was Roman Catholic, my mom was Lutheran, how that was difficult on the family of us having two churches. So try to move them towards the same church. But then if it's simply, you know, we want to get married here, but we have no intention of being a part of the LCMS or a part of the Lutheran church, then that would be, for me, as a pastoral call, just simply saying, you know, maybe you'd be better off going to whatever church you're going to worship in where you have a pastor. That's just common sense, okay? All right? Question six. Do you as a pastor see any changes in the Constitution, bylaws of the Zion Lutheran Church in the near future to take a position, uh, stand on same-sex marriage? Um, Yes, and we already did it, okay? So kudos again to our elder board for already doing that. Uh, Next question. If Zion enforces firm rules, boundaries in regard to marriage, will this impact how future marriages are conducted? In other words, if we make any rules or so forth as a church uh, to protect ourselves against any potential lawsuits and so forth, will that have detrimental impact upon other people getting married in the church? Uh, A couple things to keep in mind. Uh, Number one, LCMS marriages for LCMS members only. I'll give you an example. My niece and her, her fiancé, um, they're going to be getting married next year, and they asked me, will you do our wedding? And I said, yes. Okay. And as I was working through this, I said, yes, if you're part of the LCMS. Okay. Because the problem is if I don't do that for them, okay, if, if they're not LCMS and I can do the wedding, then what happens if another person comes in, a same-sex couple, say, hey, will you do the wedding? And I'm going to say, no. Well, you did it for your cousin, right, who was not LCMS. See what I'm saying? So I told my niece and her fiancé, I said, yep, I'll do, I'll do your wedding, but you need to be a part of the LCMS. So now they're, they're uh, in uh, Bismarck, and they're looking to join the LCMS in Bismarck. And once that happens, then we just get the permission of their pastor, and I'll do the wedding in Fargo. Okay? Yep. What's that? Yep, they're ELCA. Yep, so then I, uh, so they, they said, well, we're, we're ELCA, can we do that? And I, I said, no, unfortunately I cannot, okay? Uh, and they said, well, if we have the ELCA church, can, can you come over to the ELCA church and do the wedding? I said, no, I cannot do that either because we're not what we would call in pulpit fellowship with the ELCA. Yeah, if, if uh, Lutheran Brethren, okay, I'll give you an example, Lutheran Brethren, uh, my nephew got uh, my nephew got married, and they got married at Hope, and so uh, uh, my nephew uh, and his 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 wife they, they got married, and so they asked me to come, and so I I did the wedding with the Hope pastor, and I gave the homily, uh, but under LCMS polity, uh, for the last two three hundred years that is that that would call that would be called unionism, so because we're not in fellowship. Um, I would not be able to do that, okay? So that was regardless of the same-sex uh, marriage thing. So I could not do a wedding in a ELCA church. 
or with an ELCA pastor or with a Presbyterian pastor. Okay. The, yep. The 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 um uh the way that the wedding goes, and this is my conviction as a pastor, um I, I basically say when people want to get married, I simply say, Here is the wedding service, okay, and you're free here, 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 and here, and this is where you're not. This is this is the way that I do weddings. If you want me as a pastor, this is how I'll do weddings, but you have freedom here, here, and here, so you have freedom to do things in these spots, but otherwise we're not touching it. Um, I've had uh, individuals in the previous, and I was that way too in the Lutheran Brethren, um, and the reason why I was that way in the Lutheran Brethren is I had basically a, a real bad experience when I first started out as a young pastor at a couple, and they wanted to make up their own wedding service, and I kind of let them do it, and it was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. Uh, it was irreverent. It was awful. Um, it was just disrespectful, People got done, they're like, are they even married? And I realized there, no, I have to have a standard of what the wedding looks like. And so, um, so for me as a pastor, um, yeah, I, I basically say, here's the wedding service. This is what I'm going to do as a pastor. Here's your freedom. And uh, over the last seven, eight years, I've had you know, couples saying, well, we want to do this fancy thing. And I'm like, well, I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't feel comfortable with that. And, but we really want to do it. I, so I understand, but I don't feel comfortable with that. Because you've got to keep in mind, you guys, when, when it comes to weddings, uh, every couple, and I'm, I'm going to sound harsh when I say this, but every couple wants their wedding to be unique and special. But the problem in trying to be unique and special is typically they're not unique and special because they're doing it like everybody else who wants to be unique and special as well. Like, for instance, the, uh, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be, be mean when I say this, but the unity candle. I had a unity candle at my, my, my wedding service. Do you know the history of the unity candle? Do you know where it came from? The unity candle is, was popularized by General Hospital when, is it General Hospital? When uh, the couple got married. Um, with their, boy, what's their names? Soap opera. The unity candle was not prevalent before, um, boy, the big, big fancy wedding, huge. Everyone watched it. It was a soap opera. Uh, it was a general hospital. Um, not Young and the Restless. No. No, not Days of Our Lives. What's that? I think it was General Hospital. It was this huge televised wedding. And for the first time, they did a unity candle. And then after the unity candle, then everybody wanted to do unity candles. And that was actually literally the, the start of unity candles in the church was from a soap opera. It is not ha- does not have historical roots more than 30 years ago. You know, 30, 40 years ago. Okay? It, and, but here's the thing. Do, do I let, let people do uh, unity candles? Yeah, I'm not going to, you know, with indiscretion, right? Okay? So, so for me as a pastor, yeah, I would simply say, hey, when it comes to weddings, this is what a, a, a wedding will do. And, and I've, I've graciously said, you know, if you don't want to do it, I have a church wedding, then don't have a pastor in a church wedding, right? Um, if you want to have a, uh, you know, more of a secularized, pardon me, but more of a paganish type wedding, then you can do that. You can do that at the Holiday Inn, right, or the Ramada. If we're going to have a church wedding, we're going to have a church wedding. Okay? Um, so, uh, changes, uh, marriages for LCMS members only, um, that's not going to impact tremendously at all. Uh, keep in mind the Zion Statement of Faith, the small catechism in Zion Marriages Policy, we have that in force. So, what, what it might mean is, is for couples to go through membership class before getting married. So, if we have a person that off the street that wants to get married, then the change might be that, hey, we need to go through marriage class uh, as well, okay, um, which can be done in the same time, okay. Um, Zion, and here's the other thing too, we got to keep in mind, Zion may be stigmatized in the community a little bit, okay. We may be, by taking this stance, we may be stigmatized. What do I mean when I say stigmatized? Yep, but I think we have that reputation already, so, oh well, okay. Uh, so we might be, you know, consider, well, they're kind of a little bit strict on it, and I, I would say that's, yeah, we, we, I think we've had that for quite some time, so it doesn't really change anything. It just reinforces it that we're strict. Well, I, I assume in his yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, that is it. Okay. So next week we'll go over the history of culture a little bit and uh, kind of pull back from the same-sex marriage topic and start talking about culture, what's been going on, and then we're going to move into a little bit of apologetics in the weeks to come. Okay. All right. God bless. To learn more about Zion Lutheran Church, you can visit our website at www.zionwinner.org. Thank you for listening. The Lord be with you.